So we, we literally do actually have a, we do play catch sometimes, but it's, um, I think what we really focus on first is getting people into the space, into the moment, laughing and having fun. So really kind of leaning into um, the PEA, what, what Richard Boyatzis yeah. is about and, and really, you know, we, we want our clients to be in that state, but when we're coaching, we're kind of in that state too. Hello, I'm Lisa DeHart, your host for The Coaching Studio, and I'm super excited today to introduce not one, but two guests to the studio. My first uh, well, not my first, one of the two guests is Amy Warshawski. She's an MCC and Betsy Salkind. She is a PCC, both with the International Coaching Federation. Amy brings two decades of movement and mind-body expertise into her coaching, helping clients achieve profound awarenesses. And Betsy has an amazingly rich background with improv comedy, having performed with Guilty Children, an improv group, as well as teaching at Emerson and MIT. Both bring unique energy to coaching and together they're pioneering improv for coaches. It's a thrill to have them both here. Amy and Betsy, welcome to the show. So glad to be here, Lisa. So, so happy to be here. Thanks so much for having us. Oh, I'm very excited. I think it's going to be a very uh, fun conversation. I have a personal interest in this idea of improv. I, I, um, I love acting classes, and so I just can't wait to hear your take on it. But before we even go there, I would really love to get a sense of how each of your unique journey that even brought you into coaching since you have these very varied backgrounds, very varied. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Me first, Betsy. Okay, I'll go first. Usually Betsy goes first. It's just our thing. Um, so I came into coaching. I got really interested in it when I was about 28. And then I decided... Um, just because what was right for me that I wanted to take um, more of a life journey before I got into coaching, not really knowing what it was. So I started to do event planning and I did very large community events and I really loved that. And then um, I also started teaching a mind-body technique that combined martial arts and dance and the healing arts like yoga. And then uh, a couple of years, number of years after that, I suddenly, something sparked getting back into coaching. And um, I just, I took one class and that was it. I started with the um, co-active school, the coaching coach training. Institute and I decided to just step in for one and I was hooked and did all five and then did the certification. Was there anything in particular that really sparked you to come back? Like, was it a sense of maybe I got my, I've done enough of my journey now, I'm ready to explore something further or I'm just curious the spark. Oh, that's such a good question. I had been out of the work world and taking care of my kids. And it felt like the right time to come start to come back in. And I know what it was. I studied um, imagination, creativity, and leadership at um, Leslie University. And I loved, it was very focused on the um, on experiential learning and growth. And I kind of fell in love with it, but I knew that that wasn't quite, it was more therapy based. And I knew that just wasn't quite the way to go. And I think that that sparked for me. Oh, remember that coaching thing that you heard about so many years ago? Maybe it's time to get back into that. That is, that's cool. I love hearing that's what sparked that. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And Betsy, yeah. really, like you uh, coming from an improv background, you're like doing skits and, and all sorts of like improvisational experiences out in the world, coaching. Yeah, well, coaching is my third career. Um, the first one, I, I 
um, got, got a degree in organization studies. I went to work for the Federal Reserve Bank as a bank examiner. And after uh, less than two years, I was like, uh, no. And I quit and became a comic. And I was a stand-up comic, uh, still am. But um, but that's all I did for a long time and um, was on The Tonight Show and did all kinds of stuff and then wrote for sitcoms. I wrote for Roseanne. And then at about age 40, <laughs> um, my uh, autoimmune disease caught up with me. And I just in kind of figuring out how to treat myself or to, to manage that, I got real interested and I was always a science geek anyway. Um, so, you know, it was all about lifestyle stuff that really made the difference. And then I became the sort of go-to person in my community for anyone who had thyroid disease and then anything autoimmune. And then people started sending me their mothers and their friends and all kinds of people. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I should, I like doing this. Um, maybe I should get some kind of credential. And uh, I trained at the Mayo Clinic. Um, so my background in coaching started in health coaching. And then I discovered that I wasn't, what I was doing wasn't really coaching. <laughs> it was telling people how to fix their problem. That seems to be a well, big aha for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And I loved real coaching even more. And there was no going back. So that was really, my, and I, what I found was actually it was, there's so much overlap between improv and coaching. Um, it's all about you know, listening, being present, um, really being in the moment with whoever else you're playing with or, or working with. And um, it's really been my part of my coaching career to start to bring them together. So I think when I first started coaching, I was suddenly very serious. And, <laughs> yes, she was. Uh, yeah. And I was like, <laughs> a developmental stage for most coaches is yeah. that we go, I know nothing. I must do this perfectly. Right. 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 And we get the kind of the deer in the headlight or guppy look on our face. Um, and then, <laughs> and then to kind of loosen up a little bit and start having fun again. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's an interesting thing. I, I mean, part of the reason I have the both of you on is because it is sort of a unique thing to see a real partnership when it comes to coaching. And I think there's, I think there's probably something for people to really learn. Like, how do you even discern who do you want to have a partnership? Because it's probably not everybody. I mean, there's something going on here. That's a great synergy. How did you guys hook up? Well, we met, we uh, both taught and mentor coached and assessed in a health coach training program for five years. So we worked very closely together in a team of five coaches for a long time and very intensely and just became friends through that. And I think when the pandemic hit, we started offering, you know, groups together to support our mentor coaching clients in um, adapting. And because all of a sudden their clients, all their long-term goals were out the window and, and it was just a very different scenario. So we just started uh, supporting coaches in groups and, um, and we just really enjoy working together. We have a really complimentary skill set and as well as just a shared joy in everything coaching. And we didn't meet in person for three years. Yeah. Is that it, was yeah. a crazy moment. Um, I would say that one of the things for Betsy and I, in terms of how we started working together, it was very organic. Um, it wasn't contrived in the sense of we're going to work together and we're going to make this happen it was more us having so much fun together and then one day we thought oh this is kind of important work this is serious stuff and and that's when we we started to it it blended into its own business yeah and we were we were doing it part time for probably well, definitely a couple of years while we were still teaching in that program. And then when the program closed, we kind of launched full time into this. What, and I mean, I think I think like any relationship, there's probably like navigation that has to happen and how you sort through working and being with each other. But also both of you are creative and have ideas and have experience as coaches. How did you navigate your, like how you are being with each other to, to work with each other? 
Well, I would say that we we actually use a lot of humor um, and, and a lot of coaching skills. So we always check in with one another. How are you doing in the beginning of we have we're bicoastal. Betsy's on the West Coast, I'm on the East Coast. So when we get together to meet, it's by Zoom, which we've been doing for years, almost exclusively, except for the couple of times where we've gone to see each other. And so, um, you know, we always check in and take some time to see how the other one is doing and it shifts from day to day. But the humor part of it is like, maybe I'll come on and be cranky or Betsy will be cranky. I'm like, you cranky today, you know, and not <laughs> overly serious or, or okay, okay, I'm, 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 I'm doing it, doing it, you know, like just lighten it up and, and be okay. And when we need to have a serious conversation, I think what's at the heart of what we do together is joy and friendship. And if that is not working, then that really takes precedent over the business part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to think if I can really add anything. We, we have coached each other formally um, at times if somebody feels the need for it or sometime for, I think we had a little period there where we had a regular uh, exchange of coaching and we both really respect and, and love, admire each other's skill. And so there's, and, and the differences in, in how we work and what our skill set is, there's a lot of overlap, but there's a lot of difference too. And I think we both really appreciate that in each other. And, um, you know, when you're building a business, it's the, the money, sometimes it's there and sometimes it isn't. And it's, you know, it's, it can start out slow and you never know <laughs> what's going to happen with that. So I think what's most important is, do you enjoy what you're doing and do you enjoy who you're doing it with? And we really do. And we you both- know, I, don't, I don't know how familiar you are with Gottman's work, John Gottman's work, but he's really the foremost researcher on relationships in, I think, the world. He may not be at, anymore, but I think he probably still is uh, just for his years of experience. But he talks about things like this turning towards each other and the, the humor that shows up and the willingness to accept the humor. But also something else that I heard you guys say that I think is crucially important is that the goal isn't the business. The goal is the friendship. The business is something that happens and we do that together, but the friend, it's friendship first, right? And not business first. So when there's a problem, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's let's resolve the friendship problem first and make sure we're good before we press on further. And I, I mean, I think that's probably true of every relationship that does well, whether it's a, a marriage or um, a business relationship or uh, a friendship right? That, the, that there's a priority of, it's not you or me, it's a, the we of us, how we mm -hmm. are being with each other. And we do with that first. Yeah. I love that because I think, I think that's crucial if in any uh, partnership that a coach might even consider having a business relationship with somebody, write a book together. I mean, anything doesn't matter, right? How do we, how do we generate that idea of the it's friend the friendship is important yeah i'm thinking about gottman who by the way was married three times but uh <laughs> yeah well he's an expert on knowing when it's not gonna work um right. and <laughs> but one of the things that we do which i think certainly gottman it's part of his thing is we really um sh share our um uh, our gratitude for each other all the time you know, and we're specific about it. We use, you know, affirmations and we're, but we really do um, prize each other and, and make that verbal. So. Yeah, yeah no, I love that. I, I, it's sort of like, even in my marriage, it's like, I just feel so lucky to have met you, um, you know, it's right, like, right. instead yeah. of like, uh, um, you know, it's that sense of gratitude for the relationship. I feel the same way about my best friend too. It's like, I'm just so happy to have met her at the time that I did. We always tease my husband. We've been together longer, but I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it is that sense of this relationship is really fun foundational. 
And so you guys then COVID hits and things are switching around and you guys are starting to build your business and, and you have a history in improv, Betsy, but I mean, you've got a history in body work, Amy. And so how did this evolve for the two of you, this idea of coaching with improv? Because I'm super interested in hearing more about a, that, that kind of work, but also how you guys the origin story of it, I guess. Yeah. Um, so one day Betsy said, we, we like, we were giving, actually we were giving vision workshops and one day we were talking to each other, just sharing, you know, what our vision or what we would want to do. And Betsy said to me, you know, I've always wanted to do this thing with improv and coaching. I think there's a real synergy there. And I, had this vision and offering a workshop. And I am the one who would set up the workshops literally on acuity scheduling. I put the name in how many people we'd have. And I said, great, when do you want to do it? And she <laughs> said to me, really? I'm like, yeah, like, <laughs> just tell me a date and we'll mark it down and we'll, we'll fly it up there and see what people think. And at least that's my recollection. I don't know what you remember, Betsy, but I think, feel like that's how it started. It's pretty much, I want to do this. And you're like, I'm going to make it happen. And I mean, we both, I think, achieve much more together. We, we were always saying that, that I would not do as much as I'm doing if it wasn't, if I didn't have you as a partner. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, Amy has really supported me in everything along the way. And I think when we first started, improv for coaches was my thing. And she did a lot of um, somatics workshops and, and we sort of had separate things that we did, although we did come together on, um, we had a business incubation group that we did together. So, but over time we're now we're both really, you know, bringing together the somatics, the improv and, and really working on that together now. How do you bring together somatics and improv? But does one do that? <laughs> well, I think that somatics is really, I mean, I'm even thinking about metaphors and your upcoming book, Listen. I've been, you know, I'm kind of trailing after you watching you along the way, a little bit of a fan from afar. And I'm thinking about how much improvisation, and I think it's Betsy who really highlighted this for me, is part of what we do as coaches. And I think semantics is part of what we do as coaches. We're always listening, we're watching, we're hearing, we're seeing beyond what the person is saying. Um, it's really a, a sensory experience to coach another human being. And the more we do it, the better we, the more we let go of that kind of held way of holding your body and relax into our own bodies. So for me, they really go hand in hand. Um, I would wonder what perspective you have, Betsy. Um, well, I see, the, you know, the, we came together in it in a couple of different ways. I mean, one is that Amy always has that, that point of view. She's always, when, when giving feedback, she's noticing all of that. And, and in, so it, bringing it into even something that didn't explicitly have it. And then I think we developed specifically, a, we took the somatics course that, that Amy had and we built it out using more improv structure and more, um, more experiential way. So we kind of brought them together in that way. And now they're really, I think, pretty integrated because we are embodied. We might not look at it in Zoom. Um, and we, we actually do things in our improv on Zoom to get people to realize they have whole bodies and to actually use them. <laughs> what? I'm not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it, it kind of is a natural fit and we just have adapted it all for Zoom. Yeah. Well, and, and something that you, that you said, and Amy, I think it was you that said it, but this idea of we are full full sensory coaching, right? Like we're not just coaching with our heads where there's this whole energetic experience that's happening between you and your client and being able to sort of, I don't know, get into the flow of whatever that energetic shifts and tides and ebbs and flows that happen in a coaching conversation where we're noticing not only the client's somatic responses, like 
or, but our own, like, Ooh, what just happened there for me? And just being curious with the client, if there's anything, I mean, the client's always a choice to say, yeah, no, that's your stuff, not mine. <laughs> but I mean, the, but the fact is, I think that learning to be in that somatic space with each other, uh, with with our clients, with each other, but in, in the way that we're curious if I'm hearing you correctly. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. I mean, when I think about that, I think about what I learned way back when in the fundamentals course in Coactive, where they talked about level one, level two, level three listening. So level mm -hmm. one was listening to another for yourself. Oh yeah, you know, I do that thing too. Yeah, I went skiing last weekend and not really listening to the other person's story. And level two is really listening to what they're saying. And as I understand it or, or interpret it, level three is listening to the whole person, the environment they're sitting in um, and the way that they're projecting with their energy. So, uh, and I think so much of, improv involves the entire body. So there really is no, there's a very, there's not even a fine line between them. And mm -hmm. um, I, through my work with Betsy, I think in the beginning there was a moment where I was like, well, Betsy really created this. I mean, this, this is Betsy's baby, improv for coaches. She created it. And so then how do I fit into it in a way that is organic for us where she's still owning her creation and I'm able to partner with her um, and let it develop and grow from there. Mm -hmm. And I think we've managed, what do you think, Betsy? We managed that pretty well. <laughs> Let's find out on this show. This is a, no. <laughs> exclusive. coming to you what? live. <laughs> we haven't had to go to couples counseling yet. So <laughs> I'm knocking on wood over here. <laughs> I hope the question lands well. Um, <laughs> well, let me tell you about it. No, um, but I think also, you know, Betsy, obviously you're the expert here on improv, but my experience of improv has also been, the, and I think the somatic piece really fits nicely in this, but that ability to catch the ball that's tossed to you right and and to play with it and then toss it back. Oh. Um, so, Ball to you, Betsy. <laughs> so we we literally do actually have a we do play catch sometimes, but it's um I think what we really focus on first is getting people into the space, into the moment, laughing and having fun. So really kind of leaning into um the PEA, but like what Richard Boyatzis yeah. is about and and really you know, we, we want our clients to be in that state, but when we're coaching, we're kind of in that state too. And so we really create that experience in learning. Cause I think a lot of times when we're learning things, it's not that it's like, I have, you know, there's a, a very different energy. So we really think about energy, mood, um, what state we're in. And we come into that state as a group together. And then we build from there into what's the skill we're working on today and approaching it in a way that's still fun, that's still um, uh, joyful and low stakes, and it's it's really I can't remember what I'm what I'm answering now. So well, and that's fine because you brought up a couple <laughs> things that I think are really crucial, and I love you bringing up the positive emotional attraction, the PEA from Richard Boyatza's work, and I think it's so crucial because yes, gosh, we want our clients to be in that positive mindset with the the ability to learn and be creative on their own and curious and on their own behalf. But God, yeah. Can you imagine? I've always felt as a coach that performance or perfection kills and performance kills um, presence. And that idea that we have to do it in this rigidly right way of doing it and how just even the deep belly laughs, right. That, that people can get into shift them into more of that positive, you know, that positive emotional attraction for themselves. And, and so as you work with your students and you're looking at how the laughter and having fun and being in their bodies, as long as that's fun, um, impacts their coaching, what do you notice? A huge impact. 
I mean, it, they, they are present, more present and, and having fun. And you, you can't be self-conscious and having fun and being present at the same time. And I think what we've heard back from those who've taken the courses is that it really um, made a big difference in their coaching. And they they brought it back into their coaching in different ways. Some really, we never intended it to be things you do with your clients, but some of them do. And they found ways to, to apply it that's been really helpful. But I think it also just has the impact of giving them more freedom like they're not worried about making a mistake now. They see that, that there's opportunities there and there's just a different approach, I think. Amy, what do you think? Yes, I'm thinking about the story that Betsy and I, we were talking about the other day, how our students never ask us for a break. We do two hour sessions in the series. And it, you know, of course they're welcome to go and take a break and, and take care of themselves. In every other course we've offered and do offer, we always have break time. And in improv, we don't. And no one complains about it in all the years we've been doing it. So there is something about the energy that's coming into that space that just, it, it, it it's so joyous to be in that, in that way. And I think when you bring that, when they go out and then bring that knowledge, that that joy in that fun is available. And, and also that deep sense of listening and connection. So not every coaching session, as we know, especially nowadays is easier fun, but what they have access to, I think, and what I see in our students is more a curiosity about, like you were saying earlier, Alyssa, um, oh, what's happening in my body? Wow, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable. How's my clients talking about this? This doesn't mean that my client's making me uncomfortable. Maybe I'm just, my body is telling me that this might be a moment to slow down because they're feeling uncomfortable. And I think that the improv games that we do and the exercises that we create for them allow them to be vulnerable in the moment and feel that for themselves. Because a lot of times we're doing a pairing where um, one is coach and one student is client. And so you're both experiencing it, uh, depending which session you're in, as a coach and as the client. Yeah. yeah. The word I would that comes to mind for me is freedom. I think, I think the coaches feel more freedom in their coaching after doing improv. Well, and the word that's coming to my mind is that level of transparency mm -hmm. where we're being fully vulnerable and transparent, like, Hey, I'm noticing this in my body and I'm, I'm just going to name it and share it with you. And then you get to toss the potato back to me. And, um, and then I get to toss it back to you. We were playing. Um, and, and you, you talk about this joyfulness in coaching. And I mean, I, if I'm not laughing with my clients on a, I mean, and we talk about really like serious stuff, like parents who are coming to end of life and all kinds of like serious topics and coaching. And we still find ways to connect with humor. Yeah. You know, and I think, you know, when you think about just how hard life can be on so many different levels for people, how do we explore those things if we can't find a way to tap into sort of the universal joyfulness of just the, I don't know, the crazy audacity of life, mm -hmm. right? You use the word play. And I think that's the key really is that sense that we're playing together. And there's something about play where it's like, we all agree on what the what the structure is and, and what the ground rules are. And that creates like a safe space to co-create. And we really think that, that that sense of play or playfulness makes all, first of all, it makes our classes fun, but I think it also really uh, is so useful in coaching. And I agree with you hundred percent, you know, the, the darker it is, the more it's helpful to find the humor in it together. And it's not that we're laughing at the situation, but it is that we can sometimes just really find to laugh at our own response to the situation yeah. or how we would like to be responding to the situation, um, you know, and how do we hold on to 
you know, the pieces that are important, but then let go of the the trauma that we are sometimes self-inducing on ourselves. I say that as a past trauma therapist and just, um, you know, how much trauma I've created for myself along the way and <laughs> how much trauma I've seen people be very attached to. Um, and how do we let go of that so that we can move forward? And I think so much of that comes down to exactly the things that you guys are talking about, which is how do we get playful and take ourselves and, and everything a bit, a little less seriously. I'm remembering that one of the first instances where I brought humor into <laughs> when we were teaching and the student said, well, well, what do we do if the client starts crying like right at the end of the session? And I said, we got to make them cry sooner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they, they, you don't want to wait till the last minute for that. <laughs> it was so reinforcing. The response to that was it, it just released it for everybody. And it just gave everybody that space to to not feel so scared of that and to, yeah. you know. Well, and I love that too. It's so funny, you know, I, I, and I think also check your question because of it, the very last moment you're asking, is there anything else you need to talk about today? And the person's like, I'm getting divorced. It's like, <laughs> boom. Uh, yeah, we have one minute left. And, uh, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Can you hold on to that till next week? Um, and, and so I think to your point, you know, asking uh, that a bit earlier, like, is there anything else that might be important for us? Like what's really important for today is really good to do an agreement setting so that we don't do that at the very end as we're coming to a close. Um, that is so funny though. Yeah. Make them cry sooner. Yeah. You know, the, one of the things that's coming up as all, as you're talking about is um, the whole concept of, of, play as a student it really primes that pump for you know learning and so if somebody is experiencing that as a student of coaching then they understand the PEA we're not just reading it about about it in the in helping people change we're experiencing it ourselves it makes our classes very rich learning environments, hopefully. I mean, that's what I believe. And then also, <laughs> right, I mean, if I do say so myself, <laughs> um, but then I'm also think, hoping that they go back and they understand that our energy and the way that we present ourselves with a client in the most deeply darkest of times, as well as in the brightest and lightest of times, helps our client um, tether to us, not connect and become atta over attached. But if we are strong and centered in the way we're presenting to our clients and offer them the possibility of showing up however they are, permissions, there's all this, there's just a tremendous parallel between us and improv. Yeah. And I mean, and kind of to your point also, I mean, what we experience in our bodies and, and how we allow ourselves to notice and feel and name and acknowledge all the myriad of, a, of a possibilities of what happens as a human being. I mean, the body keeps those memories. We remember that felt experience, right? And so if the felt experience is, yes, this is sad. And yes, I have a model of there is life that continues and and what do I want to do with it? And how what is that experience for me? I think you open up so many possibilities for a person to be at choice with more than just one or two choices, but rather the whole pantheon of opportunities that may be between this and that, right? Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, I think, I mean, all coaches improvise all the time, truthfully. There are, there are no scripts or there shouldn't be. And uh, <laughs> there's a book, I think that, you know, like ChatGPT says there's these right. questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the AI one is probably scripted, but um, I think, but, but what happens is, it, and I think part of what happens in our classes, people realize, oh, I am an improviser. I can do this. I, you know, and that, and they relax into knowing that they can, they're always going to have something to say. They're always going to have a source to tap into. And I think, it, I think that's really 
you know, it's it's sort of just making explicit or helping someone to realize that they have that skill and they can always tap it. Yeah, and I think that's crucially important because, you know, I, I think we've been kind of touching base on this multiple times, but that being present, being fully present in the moment and, and hearing and listening deeply and, and being curious and not worrying about how we are allows us, I mean, the questions just sort of naturally come then also because our curiosity is peaked and we're in the moment with another person. I think that's another piece of improv, right? Is this sense of being be here now. Like I'm not somewhere else. I can't be like over there and having fun with you here because I'm there and not here. I think coaches are in general, they're, they're, they're good improvisers. And, and I've d taught lots of classes with people who are not coaches. And it, I think it's a steeper learning curve for them because the coaches already have those skills of listening and um, you know, be really being there and just, a lot of the skills that you would use in um, in improv. Yeah, I'm also thinking there's there's probably an element of timing too, right? But that's yes, absolutely. I mean, when we think about it, it, so I used to do I I was a wannabe. I used to not not comedian. I'm not funny. I'm goofy, but definitely not. <laughs> Betsy's funny. <laughs> so funny. I used okay. to, um, uh, I, I, there's a whole please. story there. I'm a that, total but we're not going to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I used to do theater when I was in high school and I did all sorts of improv classes and I grew up near Manhattan. So I would take myself on the train on the Metro North and get into Manhattan and do improv classes in the city. Cause that, you know, was my jam in high school. And so you know, I, I think about like how much this brings it, brings it back to me and how much um, fun and the spirit and everything that we're doing um, puts me in a, in a totally different frame of mind every time I, I enter into the space of what we're doing together. And maybe that goes back to what works about Betsy and my relationship is we know that when we're together, mistakes get made and you know the all the rules of improv right you know it, it, there's no there's no wrong um our timing is good together going back to the concept of timing that that I was talking about and you know we don't step on each other we just step with each other and take each other's lead so you know even in partnership I think there's quite a bit of improv that has to happen as you think about the, you know, just something that a young coach might really um, benefit from hearing um, that might be useful and as they're conceptualizing themselves as coach and moving into the space of coaching, I'd love to hear from each of you sort of what is a, something that you think might be useful to, and it doesn't even have to be a new coach, it could be any coach to hear about what would allow them to maybe be more present, more in the PEA of the experience. Mm -hmm. Look at that face. Um. <laughs> There's so many. Yeah. yeah. I'm going mean, to have you whittle it down. <laughs> play and practice, you know. Play and, and practice. Yeah. And, you know, we have exercises we do um, like three word coaching that I've done with my husband and friends and they love it. And so, um, you know, to what is it that you want to learn or get comfortable with and how can you do that? Um, and you know, we, that's what we do is we just make up, okay, here's a structure that would allow someone to experience and learn this thing, but we can, everyone can do that. And it's, you know, I think, um, entering, you know, learning something new or developing something with that sense of play. Um, the same way that you would learn how to play tennis or even, even a card game, you know, in the beginning, we're really thinking about what are all the pieces and what is the structure. But then the more we kind of master what it is, 
then it's all about our relationship with the other people and what's what's being said in between the moves. And so that's, um, so I would just say play. Play and practice, I love that. Yeah, and Amy. I'd also say that, um, I like to say as coaches were witness, observer and catalyst. And at its very bare, bare bones, if we are, if you as the coach are witnessing another human being, there's nothing more valuable than that. So lowering the stakes of, I have to do this right. I just have to be here and listen to this other person. And whatever I say or do doesn't need to be encumbered by right or wrong. It's enough. We so rarely get listened to in our lives the way that coaches listen to another human being. It It's really lower the stakes. Give yourself permission to be in that space with another human being and, and show your heart. She's good. Yeah. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, she's very good. She's done this, maybe said it before. I'm not sure, but, but <laughs> once, <laughs> you know, and it's so funny too, um, on a, another one of the podcasts it came up and then there was this comment on YouTube about, it's really nice to be listened to, but come on, you know, you, you need to be doing more than that. And I think it, it was sort of funny. I said, you know, in response to that, that, it, there's a huge difference between listening and hearing people. Um, and I think that there's the, you know, the vibration of sound hitting our eardrums. And then there's the, you know, and then there's the actually being present to and witnessing and, and then being curious on another person's behalf, which is part of that, that being heard is not just, you know, I'm sitting here passively listening to you, but rather we're engaged in a relationship in this moment on your behalf. And, and a big piece of it is that capacity to really listen, but hear deeply also. So I really appreciate you bringing that up because I, I don't know, it was so funny. It just showed up on that YouTube, um, uh, on my new YouTube channel. So like, interesting different mm. philosophy than that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, one of the things I love the most about coaching is the, the invitation for me as a coach to be in non-judgment because <sighs> as a comedian, you have to have really strong opinions and, you know, it's, it's a very different thing. And I get to set all of that aside. And there's a lot of pleasure for me in stepping into a conversation without judgment and for them. <laughs> yeah. Cause uh, like, don't we get enough judgment in the world anyway, to have somebody like be non-judgmental to our, which is really, I mean, and that goes back to all those other things that we've been talking about in order to show up like that. I have to be in a state of mind where I am okay, not knowing. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And also being in a state of mind of you know, knowing that you can be quick in how you step in and out of, it's a practice, right? So the practice of stepping into a coaching session in the beginning, there might be long, long preparation. And as you get more and more used to that, you can do it quicker and quicker. And I think that happens in improv as well. That, um, and I, I definitely have learned this from Betsy, that the more that I practice improv, the quicker on my feet I am. And that's, and that doesn't mean that I'm talking at my client and super quick and my energy is all over the place. It means that I'm attuned and can attune in a certain way quicker. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that distinction. Also, I think that's an important distinction. You know, it, I'm it, as we're sort of winding up here today, I'm, I'm curious, um, when you think about thought leaders, resources, maybe a book that was really impactful to you personally in your own development and growth, whether it was at a, as a coach or just human being, um, what, what would, you know, what has been of use and in positive impact for you in your work that you're doing today or how you're, you're being in your lives today? 
All right, I'll go. Got mine. You got yours. <laughs> well, I have many. <clears throat> I mean, I love to read and learn. So, uh, so there is a very long list. But a couple of the things that come to mind uh, is Stephen Nachmanovich's book, um, Improv in Life and the Arts. And he's actually a musician, but it doesn't, it applies to everything. And um, that was one. Um, Richard Boyatz's uh, work, definitely another that really shifted the way I coach. Um, and, and then of course, Carol Burnett and Lily Tomlin and Gilda Radner, who, you know, those were really strong influences for me um, in, you know, uh, I don't have words for it, but I, I count those among my influences. I think for me from comedy, my favorite comedian was Robin Williams, who is so well known for from way, way, way back for his unbelievable ability to improvise. And that I, I just, and then his depth, what appeared to me, because of course I've never met him, Betsy has, but I've never met him. <laughs> um, his depth of character, you know, just how he showed up in any situation um, with the ability to laugh. Um, of course, helping people change. I, I agree with Betsy. It was coach changing for me. Um, I think the That's whole concept. Book. Yeah, Boyatz's book. Um, Two others that come to mind, um, one is Atomic Habits mm. because of the way that he describes identity being at the very core of start from identity. Instead, instead of saying run three times a week, say I'm a runner who runs three times a week. And that's had a huge impact on me both as a person and a coach. And then the last one in terms of creativity is the artist's way. Um, the artist's way. Yeah. Cameron's. Way. Yeah. Yeah. Julia Cameron's book. And that just the, the um, uh, opening and welcoming to become more creative and to know that there is a path to inviting that in, I think resonates on many different levels with the work that we're doing. Yeah. Well, I I think honestly, this uh, the coaching studio really came from the act the idea of the actor studio and and you know the James Lipton uh, series. But I remember when Robin Williams was on the actor studio, and I don't know if anybody here remembers that, but if you can find it on YouTube, you should watch it because he is so fully himself and hilarious and improvisational and also I don't think he stops the entire time like I mean it's just like he is just so fully present with where he was in that moment but hilarious also I just I mean and all the people that you've named are just such as inspirational people for learning from and so gosh thank you guys so much thank you so much for being on my coaching studio and not that I mean I I would wish you the actor studio also, but um, thank you guys so much for being here today and showing up so fully. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm sorry, I heard both of you at the same time. <laughs> oh, well, I was going to say, um, that's Amy. Uh, thank you for having us, really. We were so looking forward to it. And, you know, we sought you out. We're like, Lisa, we want to be on your podcast. <laughs> And I was just saying, this is the studio that we wanted to be on. This thank is the you. right one for us. Yay. And we really appreciate what you do. Well, and thank you guys for being my first um, pair. Um, you did an amazing job, Lisa, in, in having two guests at once. Yeah. Wow. It's a first. We'll see what happens. There may be more pairs in my future. I don't know. Um, but thank you again so much for being here. And